if I love goodness, right, that's the, that I'm almost like a Neoplatonist now. Like if I love the good itself, then I am aiming towards the highest, the highest. And I'm kind of moving up the, 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 this hierarchy of love, you could say. Hmm. Um, and so that's not easy. So it means that, you know, what, what the, let's say the saints would say and what, you know, some of the philosophers would say is that, that or even like, I don't know, a Zen Buddhist would say is that you can arrive at those things by a type of intuition, insight, right? You can arrive at insight and that insight is not contained in the mechanisms that I'm trying to, to, to bring about. It's mm -hmm. contained in, in a, in a type of grasping that happens, right? When you see that things come together and all of a sudden you see a kind of shining light of, of, uh, of unity and you grasp it, that's insight. Yeah. But insight cannot be, uh, can very difficultly be explained by or the codified. type of discourse that rationalists want to use. Okay. I just spoke so you have a, so we have a problem, which is that which is that on the one hand, this is what all the traditional things are talking about, right? This is what so many of the religious, uh, let's say, the theologians, the mystics are talking about, which is the capacity for insight. But y you can't totally describe it. You have to play around it. You have to skirt around it. You have to point at it. And then when you have that, so you could say the same, like you could, let's, let's use an example that's very simple. It's not, there's no woo woo here. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, I can tell you what it's like to, to be in love. I can say it, I can give you, tell you a million ways and what it, what it's like to be in love. But unless you, that happens to you, unless you grasp that, unless you reach that insight, you will never, you will never fully understand what it is. You have to you have to enter into it with experience. Now, the the ways we talk about it can help guide you in that insight, can help stabilize that insight, can help you, but it's not enough. You have to have you have to kind of enter into that experience. And it's this actually, this is the same for everything that you describe. This is the same for anything that has identity. You know, I can describe a hammer all day long, but the grabbing the hammer in your hand and using it, that's that's the insight of the hammer and it's not it cannot be reduced to its to its quantifiable things can't be reduced to its description can be reduced to, even to its function there's something about it which is more and that mm -hmm. is that is the very mysticism that like that 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 someone like lindsay wants to decry but mm -hmm. you can't avoid that because mysticism happens not just in someone in some saint's cave where they're praying and they're having a, it happens every time you encounter unity in the world. Every time you transcend the multiplicity of, of, of uh, quantifiable things into the unity that binds them together, you're having a little mystical experience. Yes. That's as true for, it's as true for a pencil as it's true for falling in love or going to church. All these, or 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 you know, putting your hand on your on your breast and and saying the pledge of allegiance, like these these things are all mystical in their nature. Yeah, but the issue then is that when we observe um, human beings unifying in their unification in a bigger group. Like once they start to formulate or to congregate through religions, through uh, creeds, through uh, political nations, parties, through nations, families. businesses, uh, friendships. Careers, How about that? Friendships. Um, well, fr friendships is still like families and friendships is still more organic. But once we get into a higher level, like a, something beyond a township, there's the capacity for authoritarianism, totalitarianism. But there's um, the same a in unification, a, a unification. It's actually the same in a person. A person can have an authoritarian. A, a person can try to apply authoritarian principles to the multiple aspects that constitute it. Right, Did and you, you see people example? do that all the time. Right, okay. they they deny something about themselves. Right, they they just try to push it into the as if it doesn't exist, and they try to compress right this idea of uh, repressing certain things in you. That's an authoritarian approach to a single being. Yeah, and so the authoritarian approach can happen at every level of unity, from the person to the family to the city to the state to the to the basketball team to any type of unity can is in danger of having that characteristic. 
There's no, there's no way around it. And so when right. approaching any given group of people, how does one analyze that to see if it's healthy or unhealthy or good or bad or evil or, or whatever? Like, like what, what tool set, how do you describe that which allows you to assess whether this unity is proper or improper? Well, the unity itself, I mean, how can I say this? Unities are always around a purpose. Right. So you, the, first of all, the purpose can be bad. Right. You can have a street gang who's who the fact of their unity yeah, is to okay. rob people and kill people. And so the purpose of the unity, that's what unity is always du directed towards purpose. And so you can you can, first of all, identify the, the reason for the unity and that can be a problem. And then you can also look at the mechanisms by which the unity is manifesting itself, which is that the, you know. The. The. Uh, the traditional vision, I think, of unity is something like a dance between unity and multiplicity, right? It's it's this kind of breathing in and breathing out. Uh, was it one of my favorite quotes from Rumi, who talks about, you know, he says, yeah, you know, if you if you keep your hand always open or if you keep your hand always closed, you will be paralyzed. But you know, actual experience is in the very subtle moving open and closed of the hand. That's how reality works. Is this this subtle dance between unity and multiplicity. Uh, and that's how you can recognize if something is balanced or not. And it's, and it's so it's the same in a family, you can see that, right? It's like, if there's too much multiplicity, then it's chaos in the house. And then, you know, everybody's doing their own thing and things are messy and nobody can, and, and everybody's screaming at each other. Uh, and if there's too much unity, right, then, then everybody is afraid and everybody is just in line and just doing the things they need to do. And there's no, variability, there's no joy, there's no kind of, uh, and so you have to always, no matter what unity you participate in, you always have to find a balance between the two. And that's true of yourself, by mm -hmm. the way, as well. If you work 24 hours a day, you will collapse. If you play 24 hours a day, you will collapse. And if you sleep 24 hours a day, you will collapse. Like there is a balance of attention and distraction. There's a there's a balance of reason and emotion. All of these things are part of how a human being functions. Uh, and if you deny one aspect of it, then it builds up and it explodes. And by the way, this is my critique of, of the kind of rationalist enlightenment mode is that it ignores aspects of reality it just says, just says, don't do that. Don't be unreasonable. You know, don't follow your emotions. Just be, just be reasonable and logical and, and, uh, and scientific and you'll be fine. Right. And that's the equivalent of saying, you know, you could work 20, 24 hours a day if you just don't sleep, Benjamin, hmm. you know, just don't sleep. And if you sleep, I'll tell you, oh, I told you not to sleep. Why are you sleeping? If you become distracted, I'll say, well, why are you being distracted, Benjamin? I told you, just pay attention. Hmm. I, it seems like you're not following what I'm saying. If you just did what I said, then the world would be perfect and everything would flow like, like you know, would flow wonderfully. Hmm. And so this is the problem with the, this is the problem with the Steven Pinker and kind of, you know, uh, Hicks and all of these, these kind of enlightenment types is that they, they decry an aspect of humanity which is part of humanity and is not only part, but is inevitable to humanity. And then they're surprised when they watch it blow up. They're surprised when they see it explode in front of them. And they're like, well, no, we said just be reasonable and, uh, you know, just follow these, these things. And if you do, then you'll be fine. And this is where we are now, by the way. This is the moment where we've reached, which is that the things that the Enlightenment ignored, which is, for example, the means by which we attain unity. That's not exploding in everybody's face. They said, just be reasonable, be rational. If we're just rational and scientific, and we we develop scientific things and more machines and more and more uh, you know and more technology and more science, then we'll all be we'll be we'll have food and and wealth and money, and then we'll be happy, right? But sadly, that's not what's happening. That's obviously not what's happening. And now that narrative is...